prior to that, that, um, that the apostles were faced with a, a dilemma. They were trying to minister the word of God and preach the word of God, but yet there were some things that were lacking. Uh, and they called um, seven faithful men, the Bible says, that was full of the Holy Ghost and uh, set them in motion to do the work of the ministry. And part of the work of the ministry was to take care of the widows and, and to take care of the needs that were arising among the believers. And uh, it, was, it was a job. It was a task. It was tough. Um, and then we find out that early in that calling that Stephen was killed because of his faithfulness to Jesus Christ. He, he was stoned. He was put to death. He, uh, he laid at the feet of Saul of Tarsus and uh, drew his last breath. But you said, that's a sad story. In the flesh, it was a sad story. But the Bible teaches us that he looked up to the heavens and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God the Father watching over that. I want to say this here to you. God pays attention to us. He pays attention to our every need. He pays attention to our every detail of our life. God's watching right now. Uh, there's nothing we can hide from the face of the Lord. And I'm forever grateful for that. I'm grateful that when nobody else is paying attention, I know God's paying attention. But we find Stephen as he takes his last breath and he is uh, ushered into the presence of the holiness of God because of his faithfulness, because his relationship was cemented in Jesus Christ. And that's important for us to understand today. Uh, we got to have a relationship, not an acquaintance. We can't be in an acquaintance with Jesus. We have to have a relationship with him. I, I, I hate to say this, but there's uh, probably the vast majority of churches today have got people sitting in pews who just have a casual acquaintance with Jesus. But yet there's very few who really have truly born-again relationships. You say, well, preacher, can I have that today? You absolutely can. And you may be sitting in this church today, and, and, and your heart is knit to the heart of God. And I trust that it is, and I pray that it is. But if you're not here today, I want you to really look at this scripture because the scripture will teach us what we need to know. I don't have anything good to say. I don't. But the Word of God has something real good to say. Amen. So we're going to look at that today. But before we do, let's ask God to bless the reading of the Word. Father, we love you and we thank you. We bless your holy name today. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you did on that cross. We thank you, dear Lord, that you that you have saved us and redeemed us and give us an opportunity to have a relationship with you. And, and I pray today, dear God, that if we, as we examine our hearts today, that we won't close our ears up, God, but yet we'll open up our ears and hear what thus says the word of God. And Lord, if it pricks our heart today, Lord, help us to deal with that. We need to deal with it if it does. And I pray, dear God, that you'll draw us close to you. And Lord, we love you. Let the Holy Spirit minister to our spirits. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. We uh, get ready to look into the, the passage in, in verse number five, and we're going to see where Philip is. Um, he goes down to a place called Samaria, and we'll read that here in just a few minutes. And uh, when he goes down to Samaria, he's going to meet some people. Um, and, and some things are going to take place that, that I think that is noteworthy for us today. And we're just going to go verse by verse and, and, and break this down so that we'll understand it today. So when we leave, we'll have a clear understanding of what the Scripture says. But I thought about, as I've you know, done my study on these passages of Scripture, I've run across several different um, quotes and several different people who have opinions based off of this Scripture. Uh, but there's one that I want to bring your attention to today, and that's A.W. Tozer. If you don't know who A.W. Tozer is, you need to write that name down. And uh, look up some of his stuff. You can get on YouTube. He was a, he was a devoted man of God. A.W. Tozer had, uh, has got quite a, stuff in, uh, quite a bit of stuff in print. And you ought to pull that out and take a look at you know, what he says about God's word. But he says something about uh, God's word in relation to what we're about ready to read. He talks about the lordship of Christ. That people today are trying to separate salvation from lordship. Can I just go on record and say to you today that, that someone who truly gives their heart and life to Jesus Christ is going to allow the lordship of Jesus Christ to reign in them. There is a difference between having a casual encounter with the Lord and having a born-again experience with Jesus. 
And A.W. Tozer talks in, in quite a bit of his writings about how that people have those casual relationships, but yet they're never willing to make him the Lord of their life. Being the Lord of our life simply means this, that we surrender our hearts to him, our will to him. Uh, we give our devotion to him. And, and when we do that, he becomes our all in all and our everything. It will be the most important relationship that you have, bar none. And your relationship with your children or with your spouse or with your friends or with your church or, or whoever it may be, your co-workers will be down the list when you truly, when you truly make Jesus the Lord of your life. It's got to be the Lord of our life. He can't just be the guy that we come and, and worship on Sunday mornings. We can't do that. I don't believe that's pleasing to God. It can't be just a guy that ever so often we may mention his name. I don't think that's pleasing to the Lord. As a matter of fact, I, I, I'm convinced that relationships like that have no power. You can't separate the Lordship of God with the salvation that he offers. If we're truly born again, then we'll give ourselves truly to him. Let's look at verse number five. It says, Then Philip went down to a city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. He's doing the work of the ministry. He goes down and he shares the word of God. Verse number six, he says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So they paid attention. He drew a crowd, and when the crowd showed up, they were, they were amazed. They, they really honed in on what was taking place, which they saw the miracles and, and, and heard the, uh, the word of God that was spoken. Let me say this here. When God's word is spoken with authority and with power, then people will pay attention to it. They'll have to make decisions on what they're going to do with it, but they'll pay attention to it. So we see that a crowd, it, it begins to gather. And in verse number 7, as we continue on reading, uh, it tells us, For unclean spirits, cried, uh, unclean spirits crying with loud voices came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsy, and that were lame were healed. God was doing a work. He was doing something. It wasn't Philip that was doing it. It was the power of God that had showed up in that place and people were being healed. Spirits, the unclean spirits were coming out from among those that were wicked and, and, and demon possessed. You say, oh, preacher, that don't happen today. I beg to differ with you. We're living in a society and in a world where, where, the, where Satan is indwelling people and, and possessing them. And, and I'm convinced that the power of God that was real then is the power of God is real today. And, and, and God still delivers those that are dealing with those issues and, and we see here in this passage that they were dealing with these uh, possessions and, and they came out and people that were lame with the palsy got up and walked. Man, what a scene that must have been. Man, what an event that must have been to be a part of, to see all of that take place. And then verse number eight begins to say, and they were great, uh, they was great joy in the city. So they were excited about what was going on. They got, they got overwhelmed with it. And then verse number nine says, but there was a certain man named, uh, called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, given out uh, that himself was some great one. But all of a sudden, in the midst of all of those devils and all of those ones that had the palsy and all of those miracles that was taking place, there was one by the name of Simon that was watching as well. He was a man that had great authority in that region. He was a guy where everybody came to to try to get their ailments taken care of, their pains, their woes, and everything else that needed to be dealt with, and he dealt with it by sorcery. In other words, he used the devil's trickery to try and mock or imitate what God can only do. So we find out that, uh, that he was a, a man with great authority and great influence in that place. And verse number 11 says, And to him they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorcery. He had them under a spell. I mean, they, they, they looked at this guy and they thought, he's the one. He takes care of all of the problems that we have. He is the one. He had them under his influence. That's, in, that's very important for us to understand, to be able to grab a hold of the concept of this scripture. He had them under that influence. And verse number 12 says, but when they believed Philip preaching, 
Philip's preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. You hear that? It says Simon believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wonders beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So the Bible says that this man, this wicked man, this sorcerer, all of a sudden now he believes on the name of Jesus Christ. He believes who Jesus is. He believes that, that this man is the real deal. He believes. And, and then he goes on and, he, and he's baptized. He gets in the water with everybody else. He believes and he is baptized. He believes and he is baptized. He counts himself a among the congregation of people that were gathered there in that place. Can I just go on record here and say to you today that there are many who sit in churches that believe and that were baptized. They believed and they were baptized. You say, oh, preacher, they done punched their ticket to heaven. Oh, preacher, they're ready to go. Oh, preacher, if something happens right now, they're going to heaven. I certainly hope that they are. But can I just go on record and say here that you can believe and be baptized and still go to heaven? Hell. Just believing is not enough. The devil believes. The devil believes. Let's go on to the next verse of Scripture, in verse number 14. Say, preacher, I don't agree with that. Well, hold on for a minute. I'll help you out. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that uh, Samaritans had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of uh, the Lord Jesus. So now Peter and John caught wind of what's going on. Peter and John comes down and they're getting ready to lay hands on these believers so that they might receive the power of the Holy Ghost. Let me remind you that in the early church, this was the process of, uh, of, of, of salvation. You would believe the power of God would rest upon you. You'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you'd go and do the work of the ministry. So now Peter and John is coming. And they are they're getting ready to do what God has called them to do. Lay hands on these believers that they might receive the power of God. Remember now, Simon's paying attention to all of this stuff. He's among the congregation. I just guarantee you he comes sit down on the front pew one day. I just guarantee you he probably took up offering. Uh, he might even he might have even went on visitation. I, 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 Simon was one of them guys who got in. I mean, he got into the mix of all of the stuff that was going on at the church. I mean, he was cooking the, uh, the hamburgers at the, uh, at the cookout of the church. I mean, this guy here, he was, you know, he was counting the money on Sunday afternoons when the tithes was taken up. I mean, this guy, he was in. He believed and he was baptized. I mean, why are we to doubt this morning that he wasn't the real deal? I mean, why can we say this morning, Simon wasn't saved? What do you mean he wasn't saved? Well, hold on a minute. We're going to get there. But let me just remind you today, everybody that says they're right with God is not right with God. Preacher, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. I thought, I thought if I went to the altar and just had an experience with God, then that assured me heaven. Look, I had a lot of experiences with God. And if I'd, have, if I'd have died before I was the age of 23 when God truly saved me, you know what would have happened? I'd be burning in hell today. I can speak from experience. I've been to a lot of altars. I've been to a lot of altars and laid down on the altars and prayed and asked God, you know, for this or for that. But I never truly asked him to be the Lord of my life. It was only when I was 23 years old and laying in a hospital bed after God had, had tried to get a hold of me to shake me that I realized that I needed to be saved. Just going to the altar and crying some tears ain't going to get it done, honey. You've got to have a repented heart. See, that word repentance is a word that's not oftentimes used in the church the way it should be. Uh, we, we, we say, let's just accept the Lord. Let's just believe on the Lord. Let's just, do let's just believe and everything will be okay. It's not... Listen to me. God wants a relationship with us. He ain't the Lord of your life, then he's not a part of your life. Right. If he's not the Lord of your life, he's not a part of your life. Hey, listen to me, church. It's that serious. You say, preacher, I've I, I, I got to rethink some things. I, I hope you do today. I mean, God birthed this thing in my spirit and said, preach. You got to make sure that you're born again. The Bible teaches us that we got to know so salvation. I can know that I've been born again. Oh, preacher, how do you know that? Because I know that I ain't that same man I used to be. 
I know my desires are toward the Lord. I know that I want to be a part of him and him a part of me. I know. I don't want to have a casual relationship. I don't want to flirt with the world. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be a part of the world and, and try to be a part of the church. It just doesn't work. I don't want to be on Saturday nights hanging out, doing ungodly stuff, and then show up on a Sunday morning and think everything's okay. Because can I just assure you today that you need to make sure that your heart is where it needs to be. Preacher, are we going to make mistakes in life and, and goof up some stuff? Absolutely we are. But I'm going to tell you this here. You know how I know for sure I'm born again? The Spirit of God reaches down in my spirit and begins to twist that thing on me. He said, you need to get this right. What you just done or what you just said or the place that you just went, that's not, that's not of God. That's how I know I'm saved. Let's go to the next verse of Scripture. Verse number 17 tells us, then lay their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Verse 18, and when Simon saw that they, uh, through laying on the hands, laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Did you get that? When he saw what happened, he said, I'm going to give you some money. I want, I want what you got. He didn't want it the way it was supposed to be given. He didn't want it through sacrifice. He didn't want it through surrender. He wanted it the way he thought he could get it. He wanted to do things the way he's always done things. He was a part of the church, but he wasn't a part of the family of God. He said, I'll give you some money for it. Go to verse number 19. Saying, give me also the power that was that on whosoever I lay hands I may receive uh, he may receive the Holy Ghost. He said, I'll give you money so that when I lay my hands on someone, that they too will receive the Holy Ghost. He said, let me buy this power that you've got. Can I just be frank today? God's power is not for sale. It's a free gift of God, lest any man should boast. It is the power of God that he gives to us freely through salvation. You say, preacher, I want to I experience the power of God. Hey, listen, you got to surrender. you got to make sure that your relationship is what it's supposed to be and not what you think it's going to be. Hey, listen to me, folks. Uh, Simon thought, I'll just do things the way I've always done, and I'll trick everybody. Just give me what you got, and I'll pay for it. Let me go on my little merry way. It doesn't work that way. You can't sit in the church and act like the world. It doesn't work. God's not pleased with that. You can't come to church and say, you know what? Uh, I'm going to serve God today, but tomorrow I've got some other things I want to do. Hey, listen, that's not the way it works. He's either the Lord of your life or he's not in your life. He's either the Lord of your life or he's not in your life. So that's pretty strong words. It's pretty stern. It sure is. But I want you to get a hold of it. I want you to understand we can't just act any old way. We can't just do any old thing. We can't just go any old place. We can't just be that old person anymore. It's just not possible. We either give ourselves 100% to God or we don't give ourselves at all. Listen, he's a jealous God. He's a God that loves us so much that he gave himself his he gave his only begotten son, gave all that he had for you and for me. He gave everything. He didn't hold back. Think about that beautiful picture of that in heaven that God the Father looked at, uh, that, uh, looked at Jesus Christ and God the Son, and he looked at him and he said, I want you to go. And God the Son, didn't, he didn't debate that. He didn't, he didn't just say, well, Lord, is there, another, uh, is there another way to do this? No, that's not what he done. He went and he gave himself 100% for you and for I. He gave himself for us. And in return, he wants us to give ourselves to him. Simon wasn't willing to do that. He wanted, he wanted what he could get out of this thing so that he could, he could benefit and still have all of the influence. I'm convinced after I studied this passage of Scripture that Simon probably felt though as though he was going to lose his influence in that area and, and, and his revenue stream was probably going to go way down. You see, it was a profitable thing to be a sorcerer. 
It was a profitable thing to, to have that type of influence in, the, in a region. And he was about to lose all of that. And he says, I'll tell you what, I'll mask myself just like the rest of them Christians. I'll walk among them. I'll get in their baptismal waters. I'll save the, the, the old sinner's prayer. I'll do all of that stuff. But in my heart, I've never changed. Listen, folks, that happens more often than I, I, I care to even imagine. Say, so how do you know that? Because I see the fruits on people's trees. You watch, man. I, I, I'm not a judge. I'm not God. I'm not God, so I, I'm not going to judge you. But I can tell you this. If you say you're a child of the king, you'll act like one. That's what I know. And you say, how can you say that? Because when God truly saved me, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be, I wanted to be everything I could be. I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm far from perfect. But I can tell you this. My God in me is perfect. And my God is helping me every day to be more and more like the, uh, the, uh, the Christ which saved me. And I'm thankful for that. But he looked at him. He said, I, I want all of this power. And let's go to verse number 20. Verse number 20 says, this is a very sad passage of scripture. You say, well, preacher, how do you know he was lost? Here you go, right here it is. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. He believed and was baptized. But then Peter said, not only will your money perish, he said, but you will too. He believed and was baptized. He sat among the church, but yet he was lost and on his way to hell. Can I ask you today, search your hearts. That's all I ask. Make sure that you're really, truly born again. Listen, if, if I wasn't saved, I'm just going to be frank with you today. If I wasn't saved, I'd go play golf on Sundays or go fishing. I would, because that would interest me more than coming to church. But see, I got up this morning anticipating church. I went to bed last night anticipating. I made plans to come to church. Say, preacher, you're the pastor here. You've got to come. I ain't got to do nothing. <laughs> I'd stay home this morning if I really want to. Now, y'all might run me off after I don't come to church, but I can do whatever I want to do. But I don't do that. I anticipate coming to church. I anticipate coming to church on Sunday morning. I anticipate coming to church on Wednesdays. I anticipate. You say, is my salvation based on my church attendance? No, it's not. It's not. But I tell you this, I enjoy being around God's people. I enjoy being in the house of God. I enjoy that. I enjoy, not only that, I enjoy sharing my faith with people. I anticipate that next person I'm going to be able to share that Jesus loves them. I'm just anticipating that, 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 that God's going to give me opportunity to share the gospel and somebody's going to become a child of the king and truly uh, he becomes the Lord of their life. That's what I'm anticipating. And the reason I'm able to do that is because I've got a relationship with him. He becomes the Lord of my life. Say, so, preacher, when, when you first get saved, is, I mean, do you understand all this? No, it's a process. It's a growth process. I'm not all the way, I'm not all the way there yet. I'm not, but I'm closer today than I was yesterday. I want him to be more the Lord of my life more now than he was yesterday. Amen. See, folks, it's important for us to understand and know that we've been born again.